Okay, so we're being uh, recorded, live Zoom out onto our, our uh, YouTube channel as well. Welcome everybody, my name's Daryl Dooley. I don't know how many of you don't know me, but I am the president this year, last year. I guess everyone knows me pretty well. <laughs> I know, pretty weird, huh? Um, so because we are back here in the Leonard Nimoy Theater and we have a, a, a real hard deadline to get out of here, uh, we're gonna streamline the meetings uh, as good. much as we can. Uh, so not too much, not too much upfront stuff. Um, we need to distribute tickets for everyone because we do have raffles, so we can start that. Uh, Let me go to the Samsung. Uh, I'm sorry. Say again. We'll transfer it to that, right? I thought I heard something. Okay. All right. Uh, so, I guess the first thing is I just want to welcome everyone. Is there anybody, any new members here tonight? To thank the first time. There's one there, the two there. Just real quick, tell us your name and how you got how you got here. Go, so, go ahead, somebody. Hi, right, Jennifer. Okay. Okay, math and science in middle schools. Joined a couple of months ago. Welcome in. All right. Yeah, yes. A lot happening up there. All right, welcome. Who else was here? First one? Hi, guys. Ah, you're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so some of the, some of the staffing and the equipment I need are uh, kind of daunting right now. Well, you know, our guys will know what to tell you to do. Welcome in. Yeah. All right. Okay, he works a while. Wilson, or, ordering, uh, <laughs> recording and getting stuff up on YouTube there. Welcome in. Anybody else? Is that all three? Those three of them? Cassandra went online. Went online? Cassandra. Yeah, say hi to Cassandra. Hey, hi. Ca hi. Hey, Cassandra. Cassandra is a new member. I can, I can tell you about Cassandra. Uh, hi. Uh, actually, um, Cassandra came up to the last um, Griffith Park Star Party and walked up and walked past me and I said, hey, you want to look at the sun? She said, yeah. Well, that was it. She joined, she, she was so interested, she stayed in the tent and had people coming in and she was helping out the first day. She wasn't even a member. She joined immediately, has been really good. Welcome. Welcome. Really great new member. Okay, good. Um, there's not a lot of big announcements. Yes, Spencer? Closer, closer to, thank you very much. I can hear myself now too. That's very good. Wednesday night is Scout Night at Garvey. Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night at Garvey, is, is Scout Night. So volunteers, bring telescopes. Let's set up on the lawn. Um, good. Uh, a quick announcement about Lockwood. I, I just got a bunch of money from the hat from Lockwood from uh, Zolly. And we had and probably the most people that I've ever heard of ever being there. We had like 70 people there. It was like 70 plus, there was 70 plus people at our Lockwood site this past uh, dark sky. How were the Perseus? Were they good? Sorry, I'm, I missed all of that. We had enough people like it was like fireworks. It was 70 people going, ooh. Fantastic. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't there. I was having a good time. I was up with the, uh, uh, the photography winners, finally got their 60 inch nights. So we were up with the 60 inch imaging. So, you know, we were having a good time, but I wasn't seeing the Perseids. And then, and then I forgot that it was Perseid night. So when I left, I got, I'm gonna get down the hill real quick, right? I get to the gate. There was people everywhere, all the way down the hill. It was packed, it was a long time down the hill. Anyway, um, other than that, I'm not sure what else we need to do up front. Okay, so the past 
Saturday night where we had 70 people. It was family night, which is expected. Dark Sky Night is this next coming Saturday. Uh, hard rules on that night, no white light, one or two uh, exit times only. Am I still not talking loud enough? I just want to tell you all that um, if you don't talk into this mic, Zoom can't hear you. So if you just make talk or whatever and you respond in that sense. I was trying to say what they were asking, I, what I, they were saying. I just wanted to say that to everyone so they all know that, either this mic or that microphone. All right, I'm going to be out of here. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. I need to, yes. Okay, our, our Ford uh, facility is going to be open on this coming Saturday. What time do people usually get there? Before, be, way before dark if they can, yeah? Okay, and, and the, and the uh, directions for there are on our website under the, the Ford? Yeah, we'll put out a, a You're putting out a bulletin as well? Okay, great. So look for Ford. Um, I hear it's wonderful. I'll have to go there one time. <laughs> yes? <laughs> this coming Saturday? Okay, so this coming Saturday is a work day, and that's the same night as the dark sky night. So come and work, and then enjoy. <laughs> okay, um, good. Any other announcements I should know about? All right, cool. Um, Tim, would you like to introduce the um, speaker? Because you know him, I do not. I read the, I read the thing about him, but uh, I don't know him at all. Hold on. Am I on camera? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> so our speaker this evening is Steve Levin, who has talked to us several times about the Juno mission, for which he is, what, project scientist, something like that. A very important guy, right? Um, um, but this time he's going to talk about the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope, and I can remember back in the old days when he first started up this. It's an educational program in radio astronomy. Very interesting. See, he's been at JPL for a long time. I can remember when he was the fresh-faced new PhD, and then now he's got kids, and they're becoming physicists, and it's, it's all great. And so I'm just going to turn it over to Steve, so you're on. Thanks. <laughs> Let's see if this microphone is working. I might have to use the handheld. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. People online, can you hear me? Can't tell. All right. Well, hopefully, if they can't hear, they'll. If not, you know. they're up in the booth going. Oh You're God. loud and right. clear. Loud and clear. Okay. So why don't we do this? So uh, first, I just want to tell you what I thought, or actually, what my wife reminded me when I came into this theater. <laughs> um, the first time I gave a talk to LAAS in this theater, which I don't know, must be 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I was talking about Juno, and I had a water bottle, and somebody asked some question about the spinning spacecraft, and I tried to demonstrate what happens with a fluid and angular momentum by throwing the water bottle up in the air, spinning, and it landed back behind here. So somewhere down in there, there's probably still a water bottle that's my fault. <laughs> Hopefully it didn't cause any damage. All right. so. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about uh, the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope Project. And I should uh, start by telling you why I said real science and real education, what I mean by that. And what I mean by that is we wanted to have an educational project uh, for students in which they would learn about science by doing science. And they would learn about real science in the sense that they're actually making a contribution to our body of knowledge. Um, the feeling among our team, both educators and scientists, was that there were too many examples out in the world in education where students come to think that they're learning science when what they're learning is the results of science. So not how to do science, but what other people have learned by doing science. And that's totally understandable because, first of all, it's a lot easier to teach that. And second, all the content standards define that. And third, um, you're not going to, it's not a quick process to learn how to do science. But that was our goal is we wanted the students to be doing real science. And it's a partnership between professional scientists and professional educators so that we have professional scientists making sure that the science that the students do is real 
and we have professional educators making sure that they're learning something and then they're, that they're not just you know, slaves who aren't doing anything ex except providing work for scientists who are too lazy to do it themselves. So that's the plan. That's what Gabbard is. It's now been around for, I don't know, pushing 25 years, late 90s. Um, and I'm going to play this little video first just to save myself some talking and because, you know, we spent a lot of effort making this cool video, so we might as well play it. Gabbard is a way that students can learn about science by doing real science. So a key part of, of what we do with Gabbard is we want students using our big radio telescope to do science that's worthwhile and a good use of the telescope time. Teachers talk about the need for engagement, for getting the students to, to want to pay attention to what they're doing in class. If I walk into your classroom and say, today we're going to look for life in outer space, I've got 100% engagement. Every kid is interested. So SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and we gather different frequencies, and then we compare that file to another one that was taken on a different date and see if any of the frequencies match up, and that could be a candidate. We search for black holes, look for black holes, new ones that we haven't found before, so we're just collecting data for that. We look at stars, constellations, we look at different galaxies and planets and learn new things about them. We work with a maybe 20,000 ton telescope that is here in California and we get to move that. This is DSS-28, our 34 meter antenna that students use from the comfort of their classroom to look into the universe. For a lot of the students, when they push a button in their classroom and they're watching the video of this huge radio telescope and it starts to move because they made it move, that moment is when they suddenly realize this is different. So I'm the project scientist for Juno, which is a spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter right now. And one of the science campaigns for Gabbard is students observing Jupiter from the ground with our radio telescope. Science that they do, observing Jupiter on, on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis over the course of years, is valuable to our mission with the Juno spacecraft at Jupiter. So in some sense, they're part of the Juno science team. Well, Gabbard really is our, our flagship project. It's our, our partnership with NASA JPL, and we've actually just celebrated our 20th anniversary. And it's really just an opportunity for our students to partner with scientists and participate in, in real ongoing science work by participating in different campaigns or missions or projects with our JPL scientists. The coolest part about it is just the fact of radio astronomy, and we're looking at objects that are so far away that they happened millions of years ago. It's coming from something that may not even exist anymore. It takes so long for that energy to come to us. So it's almost like looking into the past. The goal is to get students uh, working hand in hand with uh, JPL scientists, uh, collecting data for existing campaigns, analyzing the data, and then uh, delivering the data. And potentially, I would even like them to use the data to support um, their own hypotheses and their own ideas. The fact that we said, okay, we're going to trust you with this multi-million dollar piece of equipment. We're going to let you do something real, and we're going to ask you to help contribute to the world, to contribute to the world's body of scientific knowledge. That whole thing, that responsibility, can change the way a kid looks at life and looks at school. So... Yeah, they did a great job of editing that with the dr dramatic music and all of that stuff. Um, and I, I want to point out a couple of things as well that we don't usually point out, or at least other people don't when they show this little video, which is the kids got a couple of the details wrong in that video. And we left it in because they got the important stuff right and we wanted it to be real. So the telescope weighs more than she said it does. and. You know, we, the black holes we look for are typically quasars where we already know that they exist. We're looking for new information about them. But we wanted to keep that in uh, because we didn't want it to be fake and because we're not all about having them learn a bunch of numbers. We're about having the people who use the radio telescope 
do something real and learn about all the ways things really happen when you're trying to do science. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the history. And I should say, by the way, I'm going to try to get this through this quick because my favorite part of any talk is the questions and answers at the end. So um, hopefully we'll have plenty of time left for, for questions. But first, let me tell you just a little bit about how this happened. So in 1996, the venerable uh, DSS-12 echo station radio telescope at Goldstone was scheduled to be decommissioned. That's a picture of it there. I think you can probably see from the back of the room how it's up on giant concrete blocks. That's because it started out as a 26 meter telescope and then they enlarged it to a 34 meter telescope, which is now the standard for most of the radio telescopes at, at the Deep Space Network. And they had to put it up on blocks so when they tilted it, it wouldn't hit the ground. Uh, anyhow, they were ready to get rid of this thing. It's getting old, it's not working great. Um, it's, it's time to decommission it. And uh, Rick Piercy, who started out as a kindergarten teacher in Apple Valley, and I think was principal of the school by that time, heard about this and said, don't get rid of it, give it to us. Apple Valley's maybe an hour from Goldstone. And the story goes that Rick had the idea that he, you know, get some friends with a truck and go over there and pick it up and carry it. He had no idea this thing was 34 meters across and, and enormous and so forth. But Mike Klein, who was the lead scientist for the Deep Space Network at the time, really liked the idea and liked the chutzpah and he and Rick uh, hit it off really well. And they formed a partnership and figured out a way to run this radio telescope over the internet from anywhere in the world and to build an education program. And eventually that small school became, uh, you know, it grew uh, and became the Lewis Center for Educational Research. Um, Mike Klein died in 2004 and Rick Piercy passed away just this past year. Um, but their legacy still li lives on in the Gavard program, the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope program. So that's the program I'm going to tell you about a little bit. As you may have noticed by now, it's radio telescope. It is kind of fun when I go to star parties or whatever and people talk occasionally about the size of their mirror on their telescope. And, and I get to say, well, the, my, my telescope that I really use is, is a 34 meter mirror. Um, but of course it's radio, so it's not the same. Um, <coughs> however, uh, Here's a little bit about sort of the size the program has become, and then I'm going to talk about the science that we do and how we do it. Uh, so basically we uh, started out with the idea that we'll train teachers to work with the radio telescope remotely, and we'll, uh, they'll bring their class full of kids online and over the phone, and we'll support them in the, the process so that there'll be an operator in Apple Valley who uh, is capable of running the telescope and capable of talking to the students and they'll hand over control. And that's basically the model we still use when we're running the telescope. Uh, students run the telescope. So somebody over the internet is talking on the phone to Nancy in Apple Valley and she says, okay, you ready? You, I'm going to give you control. And they start having control and she can see what they're doing and tell them, don't push that button, push this one. But basically, they're running the radio telescope. So we have 800 something trained teachers so far. It's probably a few more since this slide was made. Uh, a few hundred schools all around the world. Most of the states in the United States, 15 different countries, a few territories and so forth. And some very large number of students who've participated in the past and we're still growing. Okay, so what happens is if you join uh, our team, and I noticed we had a middle school teacher in the room, so I'm hoping you'll be excited about this and want to join. Very much so. Good. Uh, she said very much so for those online. So uh, <clears throat> basically what happens is you work together as a team with both the professional scientists and the professional educators on our team. And our team, by our team I mean uh, all the teachers who work with us, all the folks at Lewis Center for Educational Research, the NASA JPL scientists who work on this, people like Tim that we occasionally rope into talking to the students and things like that, um, <coughs> and support each other in a few different science campaigns and try to work on 
being useful in whatever way we can for the educators while keeping in mind that for a project to be uh, something we consider for Gavert, it has to both contribute educationally and contribute scientifically. So they re run the uh, remotely run the radio telescope from anywhere in the world, essentially. Uh, we try to align it with standards. Mostly that's based on standards in the United States. The, the rest of the world has different standards for educational purposes, to kids at different ages and so forth. In general, we found it still works pretty well. And uh, one of the things we found is your average teacher, this is a pretty new experience, and they want a lot of support. So we try to provide that. Basically have it set up so that if you maintain order in your classroom and do nothing else, we can do everything else for you while the kids are online. And if you are really gung-ho and you understand everything that's going on and you want to take over control completely, then we can, uh, we can let you have control completely and just sit back there and watch to make sure that nothing goes wrong with the telescope and anywhere in between, of course. So we have four basic science campaigns going on right now. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them. Uh, I'm not going to spend enough time talking about the science because, as I said, I really want to save time for questions at the end. But of course, you're free to ask me anything you want, including all about the, the science that I left out or didn't explain well enough. So let me start with our oldest one, which is Jupiter Quest. And uh, since uh, Juno came into existence, and our first proposal for Juno was 2004, so that was about eight years after the Gavert project started and maybe five or six years after we were really rolling and had a Jupiter campaign. Um, so uh, since then, it's been tightly coupled to the Juno project because these are observations of Jupiter and they're really valuable for what we're trying to do with Juno. Uh, and of course, I was already involved and I'm the project scientist for Juno and Mike Klein, before he passed away, was part of the Juno project and, and so forth. So we really have a, a tight relationship there between Gavard and Juno. Um, but the basic idea for the science is to study the high energy electrons that are trapped in Jupiter's magnetic field, Jupiter's radiation belts, the inner radiation belts. And because those electrons are really high energy, they're highly relativistic, so their, um, <coughs> their energy is, is five or 10 or, or, or more times their rest mass energy. They're, they're moving really close to the speed of light and they're trapped in a magnetic field which makes them move in circles. So that means they're accelerating, and you accelerate a charged particle, you give off radiation, in this case, radio waves called synchrotron emission. And we can see that all the way from the Earth. So by looking at those radio waves, we can study those electrons and figure out where they are, what their energies are, what their distribution is in the magnetic field, how they're affected by things like the solar wind and stuff like that. So that's the basic science we're trying to get at, and of course, we're a long way away from Jupiter and radio measurements with a single radio telescope aren't going to solve all, all the problems and answer all the questions, but they give us a lot of useful information. And then on top of that, what they do with Juno in the system is provide context for the measurements by the Juno microwave radiometer that's at Jupiter. So I happen to be the lead scientist for that microwave radiometer, and, as well as the lead scientist for Gavert. And when Juno was orbiting Jupiter, we're trying to study the planet itself, the atmosphere. And for most of our measurements, the synchrotron emission from the radiation belts is noise. And it's noise that's shining over our shoulders, so to speak, as the spacecraft looks at Jupiter. But it still leaks into the system a little bit. And we can measure it while we're there. It's a spinning spacecraft. It turns around and looks at those radiation belts. But we're only close to Jupiter and the radiation belts something like once a month. And we want to know what's going on in between, and we want to put it together in context to have a better model both of the radiation belts themselves and how they interfere with our measurements. So we make use of the Gavert data that the students collect. And in fact, what's shown on the right-hand side of the screen there is our latest paper led by a student. So Clara started with us as a junior in high school and got really interested in the Jupiter observations and asked if she could do more. And uh, we of course said yes and said it's about time we had a student lead, lead one of these papers instead of having uh, a professional scientist be the lead author and students as co-authors, we thought she was ready 
to become the lead author, and it took a couple of years, by which time she was out of high school and off to college, but she is the first author on our most recent paper about the Jovian synchrotron radiation. And it turns out that in a recent paper from the Juno team on observations of Ganymede, one of the moons of Jupiter, we needed to uh, correct for the synchrotron emission at Ganymede to correct those measurements, and we referenced Clara's paper because that was the best data we had on what the synchrotron was at the time that we were uh, that we needed to subtract it. So all of that is to show you that it's real science. It may not be, you know, the most bleeding edge, uh, brand new science that no one's ever done before, but it is new in the sense that these are observations that haven't been done, that need to be done, that contribute to the body of scientific knowledge. And of course, Claire is a, a uh, prime example of how it can be real education at a very high level. Now, we don't expect all our students to do that, and we don't want to cater only to the students who are going to be, become scientists and are, and are sort of elite. Um, <clears throat> but we want to accommodate them as well. Okay, so that's an example of the science. That's how, we're, how Jupiter Quest contributes. Um, the things the students learn, you know, they run the radio telescope, so they learn how to use it, and they learn that, you know, things like the fact that when, when you observe and collect data, you don't know in advance what you're going to get, and you need to work on it to make sure it's good. You need to watch the data in real time, and things like weather affected or or the radio telescope could have a pointing problem and so forth. You spend a lot of time trying to understand the data you're collecting and make sure that you know what it means. And students go through that whole process. So that's a big part of what they learn. And then, as you'll see in all of these science campaigns, we want the students to be able to look at the data, analyze the data, and report it out to the scientific community. So the different campaigns achieve that with different levels of success. So we're always working on making it better, and it depends what grade level, you know, kindergartners or fifth graders don't do the same thing as sixth graders or, or twelfth graders. Um, but they all, what they all have in common is we're trying to teach them something, we're trying to teach them something that's within the standards they're required to learn in that grade, in that year, and we're trying to make a real contribution scientifically as well. All right, so I won't spend quite as much time on the other science campaigns. Uh, we call Black Hole Patrol, that's what we call our program to monitor quasars. I don't know if everybody in the room knows what a quasar is, but basically if you have a large black hole at the center of a galaxy, and most galaxies do, we think, have black holes at the center, and that is active, meaning that there's stuff falling into the black hole, it's going to give off lots of energy, and if you're looking at it from the right direction, you're going to see radio waves coming out. So those are called quasars when you're in the right looking when you're viewing them from the right angle. And the radio waves that they give off, the variations in those radio waves, tell you something about the black hole itself or the system of material falling into it and the jets that are formed and things like that. And they also can tell you about the interstellar medium between us and the, the black hole. Because if you think about how it works, if I'm looking off at a black hole over there at a quasar, and I'm on the Earth, well, for part of the year I'm coming this way towards it, for part of the year I'm going across that line of sight, I'm going away from it, and then I'm going across the line of sight again as the Earth orbits the Sun. And that means if there's interstellar medium in between us, there's plasma out there in space, if you had it here on Earth you'd call it a hard vacuum, very few molecules per square meter, but enough so that integrated over that en enormous distance to a quasar, it interferes with the radio signal. And when you're coming across the line of sight, when your motion is sideways, you're moving to different parts of the interstellar medium and you're going to see fluctuations. When you're moving towards the object you're looking at, you're not cutting across as much of the interstellar medium. It's all pretty much the same set of, of atoms, if you will, in between you and the object, and you don't see fluctuations as big. So by looking for that six-month cycle from across to perpendicular and back to across, we can study the interstellar medium by looking at the fluctuations in the quasar. So the data the students collect is used for that as well. We try to partner 
with other people who are studying quasars in other ways. We've picked a set of quasars that are uh, valuable in part because they're being observed by other people and we can help with the cadence of how often they're observed and in part because they're, we've picked things that are visible from Goldstone out, in, out near uh, Barstow in, in California where the radio telescope is, which by the way we now have two radio telescopes and that original one, the, the uh, 26 meter that had become a 34 meter, that finally did give up the ghost and was decommissioned, but we had done well enough with Gabbert by that time that the Dan Golden, who was then head of NASA, agreed that they should give us one. And so we now have a 34 meter of our own dedicated to the product project, and we also get time on a, another 34 meter radio telescope uh, that's the research and development telescope for Goldstone. Um, but anyway, using that radio telescope, then they're collecting data, we, we choose uh, quasars that are most that are visible throughout the year for the students um, and again we want to analyze the data, examine it, understand what's good and bad and, and report on it in a way and learn to work together as a team all of the things that the students are trying were trying to learn. So this next one is kind of my favorite. I mean I'm project scientist for Jupiter for Juno I really Jupiter should be my favorite. Um, but SETI's always been a pet project of mine, and I'm the one who got this one started up. Um, <clears throat> so SETI is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And as I said uh, in that little video, I found that pretty much every time I talk to a group of students, <clears throat> if I tell them, okay, what we're going to do today is you guys are going to look for life in outer space, they're all interested, they're all paying attention, you know, they may uh, depending on their age, some of them might laugh and not think I'm serious, but when, I, when they realize I'm serious, they're uh, pretty excited about it. And what we have is we have a 200 megahertz wide uh, spectrometer with 134 million channels. So what that means is uh, if, if you think of a radio receiver like a, <clears throat> an AM radio, for those of you old enough to remember radio, um, <clears throat> think of it as 134 million separate radio receivers. That's sort of how it acts. So we can observe 134 million channels all at once and our uh, SETI campaign is predicated on assumptions because they all are. We don't know what we're really looking for, but our assumptions are that if there's somebody out there, maybe they're trying to contact us with a radio signal. And there's good physics behind that. You know, radio travels well in the galaxy and we choose a frequency that works pretty well and we also choose a frequency that uh, we're using ourselves to communicate with spacecraft and so forth. So that's one assumption. We're assuming those will be narrow band signals, put all the energy in one channel and that's because it's more detectable that way and there aren't, so far as we know, any natural signals that look like that. We're assuming that life, the time it takes life to develop, is something comparable to the time it took life to develop here on Earth, which means a few billion years. We're also assuming that whatever a civilization finally got, does develop to the level where it sends radio signals, maybe it only sends that for a few thousand years before they move on to something else or kill themselves off or whatever. If you make those assumptions, then something like one in a million stars at most is going to be sending a signal. So you had better look at a very large number of stars. Fortunately, the galactic plane, our galaxy, has most of the stars in a pretty narrow region of the sky, the Milky Way in the, the galactic plane. So what we do is we're using the radio telescope to search the galactic plane in little patches and we keep the telescope moving when we search it and the students take that data, reject the interference from man-made signals like people talking on their cell phones or whatever, keep the candidates that look like they could be real, could be coming from a fixed point on the sky, and then check the next time somebody observes that same patch of sky in our system, did the candidates that they found match the candidates 
that we found. And if they find two that, that agree, same position on the sky and the same frequency, that's when we get excited and go look a third time or a fourth time or, or whatever and decide whether or not it's, we, we believe it's real enough to announce to the world. So you ought to be asking, okay, well, why do we want to do it twice? <laughs> right? Why don't you just say, oh, I found a candidate that's something real. And the reason is 134 million channels. <coughs> if there's a one in a million chance <coughs> that our spectrometer in one of those channels is going to have its noise look like a real signal, one in a million happens 134 times every two-thirds of a second. Every time I take a new spectrum, 134 million channels, one in a million happens 134 times. So we are going to get false alarms. It's true of essentially every SETI search. And the, the hard part is eliminating the false alarms and finding the real signal. Well, if it's just random noise in the system, then when you do it twice, you'll get 100 something false alarms again, but they'll be in a different place, different frequencies. So if you see something twice in the same channel, while you're looking at the same part of the sky, that sounds like it's highly unlikely to be just random noise. But there's also interference signals. There's people talking on their cell phones and running microwave ovens and airplanes flying over with radar and things like that. We have to eliminate that. And the way we do that is the telescope is constantly moving. So a real signal coming from the sky is going to be a little blip as we sweep over it. But an interference signal from somebody talking on their cell phone or running the microwave oven is going to show up repeatedly, most likely, and last longer than the second or two it takes to sweep over a point on the sky. So the students eliminate those. We have a system set up to make it fairly easy for a human being to look at the data and throw out the interference signals and use human judgment to decide what I'm going to count, and what I'm going to keep, and what I'm going to throw away. And we let students do that. And we've actually found there's two sweet spots for the age level for the students for this. One of them, as you might expect, is high school. We do K through 12, and the astronomy students in 12th grade really like doing this, and the teachers like it, and they learn a lot of astronomy in the process and so forth. But the other sweet spot is fifth grade, because decimals are a math standard in fifth grade, and it turns out that the process that we set up for rejecting that RFI, that radio interference, requires resizing the plot over and over and over to go examine each thing that you're looking at, and you need to know your decimals to do that. And I, the way I knew we really had something with this project is before we even had it running, we'd just taken a little bit of data and we were getting ready to, to use it. I had 90 fifth graders from Compton come to JPL for a tour and I was going to run the radio telescope with them and let them point at Jupiter and do things like that. And we had a problem and we couldn't run the radio telescope. The internet was out to Goldstone. So uh, I had 90 fifth graders and an hour and a half and nothing to do with them. So I said, well, we've got some of this SETI data. Let's try it out on them. So without the telescope, just with the SETI data, I showed them how to run it and look for radio interference. And I paired them up in groups of two because that was about the number of computers we had for them to work on. They spent the hour and a half. They didn't want to stop when we were done. They did it right. They were finding and rejecting the radio frequency interference. And as I was walking around to make sure it was all going well and everybody understood what they were doing and so forth, I heard one fifth grader say to another, man, you really got to know your decimals to do this stuff. <laughs> so he was learning his decimals because he needed it, because he wanted to, to use it. That's the kind of thing we're really aiming for. That's how we knew we really had something here. They were able to do the science and they were learning not because somebody told them to, but because they wanted to and because they needed it to do what they were trying to do. Okay, so that's the SETI project. Uh, the paper for that that I'm showing is not published yet. It's about to be submitted uh, and 
It's a little trickier, right, because we're letting the students make judgments about which candidates to keep and which, which uh, how to re reject the interference and so forth. So calibration is a little tricky. And we basically did it statistically. We looked at all of the candidates they found and we said, okay, what are the signal strengths that are, that are on average being counted as a candidate? And we looked at some spacecraft to see, that with students doing that as well, to see uh, how strong a signal from a known source would have to be to show up to be detected the way they were detecting it and so forth. And so we haven't yet had a student lead one of these papers on SETI. This is our first uh, SETI paper and it's, it's led by scientists with using the students' data and, you know, giving them credit in the paper and so forth. Um, but that analysis hasn't yet progressed to the point where we're going to have the students run the, uh, lead the papers, although we expect to get there. And then finally, our newest science campaign is called Solar Patrol, and we're looking at the sun. So the idea of looking at the sun with a radio telescope uh, is we're using four different frequencies and we're trying to study the connection between sunspots and the magnetic field and the sun's corona. Those of you who are knowledgeable about the sun, which I suspect is a fair number of people in this group, know that uh, the surface of the sun is nowhere near as hot as the very thin envelope way out at the edges called the corona. And the thinking is that that's because the magnetic field from the sun, which is constantly changing and moving uh, because it's, it's in turbulence from the, the <coughs> energy coming out of the sun itself, um, that that magnetic field carries charged particles and sort of whips them up and accelerates them and produces this really high energy corona that's very thin but very high temperature, millions of degrees. But uh, we don't really understand that mechanism so well. And one way to study it is to look at sunspots, which are places where the magnetic field is particularly active on the sun, um, and look at them with radio waves because different radio frequencies penetrate a different depth down through this, uh, the atmosphere, if you will, of the sun. And so we can kind of look at these electrons moving in the magnetic field. Remember the synchrotron emission from Jupiter it's the same basic idea, but now it's on the sun. We can look at them at different depths, different levels. in the magnetic field between uh, improve our understanding of how the sun affects space weather, how it, we're affected here on the Earth, and we know that's of interest to students and the public. We're working to combine the Gavert data with data from other observatories, particularly interferometers, but there's also a spacecraft that's studying the sun um, called Parker Solar Probe. The reason we want to co connect with interferometers is we have a single telescope which lets us get a relatively low resolution uh, measurement. It's basically measuring one pixel, and that one pixel is in the neighborhood of a tenth of a degree wide but it measures it with really good calibration. If you take an interferometer of multiple radio telescopes, you can get much finer angular resolution, but the calibration goes all to hell. You don't have a measurement of exactly how bright it is, and different parts of it uh, within the same image can have some variation that you can measure out with a, a single telescope. So the idea is to use the radio telescope, combine it with the interferometers, and be able to get the best of both worlds. So that's another part of the goal here. This is our newest science campaign. It's not really underway yet. Um, so we'll, we will adjust as we learn. But uh, in terms of the educational goals, we want to teach students how to collect the radio telescope and understand how the sun affects space weather. We want to, as usual, have them use the data. So we will, for this campaign, we think, make the images of the sun automatically with the computer and what the students will do for starters is find the active regions, go look at images of the sun at other wavelengths and compare and figure out you know what we're seeing and mark things and say you know pay attention to this sunspot as it rotates around the, the sun and we see these characteristics in different wavelengths of the radio observations. 
But we haven't done that yet, so we're going to learn by trial and error a, a bit what works and what doesn't. And then our newest aspect to the whole Gavard program is tied into Solar Patrol, because that's the place where we're trying to try it out, which is we want to get citizen scientists involved. So not just students, we want to branch out into anybody in the general public who'd like to participate. Um, so I'm guessing that uh, astronomy clubs is a good place to look for people like that. And, and the general idea is very similar to what we do with the students, only if it's the general public, what we call citizen scientists, then people we've learned on, in other areas bring their own expertise and it'll be whatever they happen to be good at that they, they realize they can bring to bear on this problem. So we're trying to stay a bit open about exactly what the citizen scientists will do, um, but as a minimum, they should be able to do the same things that we have the students do. Okay, so that's the newest science campaign that tells you sort of where we're heading. And from that, I'm gonna go finally to the part that I like, which is ask me questions. So you can ask me about anything. Uh, if you ask me about Gavert science or education, there's a chance I'll know what to say uh, or how you can participate. But you can ask me anything else because I'm good at saying I don't know or I, want, I don't want to tell you or tell you about something if I happen to know. So, yeah? Can we participate? Can we participate was the question. Absolutely. So uh, what you should do if you want to get involved is start by going to the website that's shown up there and that uh, you can use the QR code or you can go to gavert.lewiscenter.org or just Google Gavert, G-A-V-R-T, and it'll probably pop up. And read about the program and there's contact info on there for how to get in touch and tell people you want to participate. And if you have ideas about how to participate, um, that's good too. But if you just want to learn how to run the telescope and, and be w one of the students, we can work on that too. Now, obviously, we're going to give preference to 30 students in a classroom who want to run the telescope rather than a single citizen scientist who hey, wants for, to for run For you it. guys on Zoom, but if when you want to ask Steve a question, data, I'll put you guys on the... There's not really uh, any limitation. On so the, the screen, starting so you point can ask for single individuals the, uh, is going to be question. with the data we've already collected and figuring out how to use it uh, just because of there's only one telescope. Or really, I mean, we can only run one at a time. We have some time on the other telescope, but at any given time, we only have one. Do they have citizen scientist uh, opportunities at the Juno? Ah, my wife's reminding me, yes, we definitely have citizen scientist opportunities with Juno. So not very tightly related to Gavert, but a little bit. If you, if you Google Mission Juno, you can find the Juno website, and it will um, tell you all about how you can participate in Juno Camp. We've been doing that for years. Well, yeah. One thing we're going to do, since the people on Zoom cannot hear your questions, I'm going to pass the microphone, give okay. you the microphone, ask the question so that people on Zoom can hear you. And then when you answer, no, everyone okay. can hear you. Right, and I won't have to repeat the question, no. which is what I've been trying to do. Yeah. Okay, so sounds good. Who's next with the question? Ah, up there, okay. Run, run, run. Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the microphone runner. Hold on. Where did he go? Ah, there he is. Meet him halfway. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. They do that at science Hello. conferences all the time, is if you have a question, you know, stand over by the stairs so you can pass the microphone to the next guy. Can you give us some basics about radio, like the speed, how you image it, and things like that? Right, so basics of how does a radio telescope work. Right, I, I glossed over that at the beginning, not because it's uninteresting, but because I wanted to save time for questions and see what you're interested in. So let me do that. It's probably, I think I won't try to bring up the picture. Uh, let me see if I at least have a picture of the radio telescope. Yeah, so if you look at that radio telescope. They still got us on Zoom back there. Oh, uh, we're still on Zoom, okay, well. Uh, the ra radio telescope is a big parabolic dish. It's just like the mirror on an optical telescope, on a reflector, only it's a lot larger because the wavelength is a lot larger. And you typically, with a radio telescope, do not have an imager at the focal plane. You don't try to make an image when you're using a single radio dish. It's possible to do that, 
but you're going to get a coarse image and the detectors are pretty big, so you're not going to get a great image. What you do instead is you basically have a single pixel telescope. So it measures the radial brightness from wherever you're pointing it and as one number, right? And it varies with time, so you're measuring it over time. And if you want to make an image, you sweep the telescope in some sort of a raster scan or something like that. So when we're making images of the sun, <coughs> we do raster scans. When we're measuring the brightness of Jupiter in the radio, it's unresolved. We're just measuring the total brightness from Jupiter from the radiation belts. And it's the time variation that we study. Same thing with the quasars uh, when we're looking at quasars. You're not going to be able to image them even with a big, huge 34-meter radio telescope. You just don't have the resolution because the wavelength is a few centimeters instead of uh, <coughs> You know, whatever it is for light is, is angstroms. It's, it's 10 to the minus 6 of that or something. So uh, the only way to get good resolution and make images in the radio, really, is to make an array of radio telescopes and use them, put them together as an interferometer. And people do that with the pluses and minuses that I mentioned before. So a single dish, <coughs> you should think of it as measuring the radial brightness from a spot on the sky. <coughs> Sorry. So that's the basics. Um, typically, <coughs> you want to do a difference measurement so you can take out all the noise and, and background and so forth. Um, so you sweep over a source where you go on and off the source <coughs> and look at the difference between what you see when you're pointing at it and what you see when you're not pointing at it. Pointing is a big issue with a radio telescope. It's huge. It's 34 meters across. You're moving it, so it's going to sag. It's going to change its shape a little bit under the Earth's gravity as you turn it around. So you have to understand what's happening with that, and you do models of how it's going to behave and measurements by looking at known sources, like, say, Venus, and put that whole picture together, and then the process in which you take data has to take that into account. And these are some of the things that the students learn as well, and <clears throat> it's different from how they might be picturing science. Many people, most people, I think, picture scientific measurements as, oh, I decide what I'm going to measure, I figure out how to measure it, I go measure it once and I'm done. But anybody who's done real science knows it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Right? You go try to measure it and something goes wrong and you figure out what went wrong and how to take care of that and you take care of it and something else goes wrong and you figure out how to take care of that and take care of that and, and subtract off all of the different extra things that get in the way, all of the systematic errors, until you finally get down to where you can show that you're measuring what you wanted to show. So we do that with the radio telescope as well. Right over here. Yeah. Thank you. I have a couple questions, but I'll just say the one. Um, you were talking about Jupiter's radiation belt. Mm -hmm. Is it like the Van Allen radiation belt, and does it affect Juno? Um, how much radiation is it high? Can it fry it, or does it affect it? That's my first question. So, yes to all of that. It's like the Van Allen radiation belts, only on steroids. It's the um, largest radiation belt in the solar system, arguably the most dangerous place in the solar system for a spacecraft, other than you know diving it into the sun or something. Uh, it does affect Juno. It affected it from the very beginning when we planned our orbit. We planned our orbit with the radiation belts in mind to try to avoid the radiation as much as we could and still do the measurements. And we used GAVRT data as part of that. We used models of the radiation belt. Uh, I was one of the, the people leading that effort. And part of the data set we used was observations by GAVRT students uh, to compare our models with observation and make sure we were doing the right thing. Um, when we first uh, planned and designed and launched Juno, um, we, it was enabled by the fact that there's a gap between the radiation belts and the planets. So if you get close enough to Jupiter, you'll fly under the radiation belts. And um, that was not an observational measurement per se. That was take the synchrotron observations we have, put it together with the model, put it together with theory and say there ought to be a gap right here and I think the data that I'm getting in the radio is consistent with the gap and so it was a little bit nerve-wracking to see if that was really there 
and uh, the person responsible for making that statement that there is a gap um, had to be a little uh, concerned as well. That was me, um, me and a bunch of other people. And, but it was there, and we were, it's right, and so we're, our orbit successfully avoided the radiation. It's also noise for our microwave radiometer instrument, and so we have to subtract it because even though we're not in the middle of it, we can see it. And ultimately, what's going to happen to the Juno spacecraft is likely when it finally uh, gives up the ghost. It's done a great job, it's lived well beyond the planned lifetime, but sooner or later it's going to die. It'll probably be the radiation belts that kill it. It'll probably be high energy electrons penetrating the solar panels or the computer or whatever and eventually causing something that it can't recover from. We have a couple of questions here too. We had one more um, it's just one more question. Um, it's about the space weather and how dynamic mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. The solar winds you were talking about, the corona, the sun, mm -hmm. the magnetic field, and the solar flares. Right. Is there like a Doppler radar type thing, a space weatherman who can see this space weather that's coming off the sun and interacting with the um, radiation belts in Jupiter? Um, can you predict it? And like, is it connected to the interstellar mediums? Does that get affected by the weather too as well, the space weather? Right. So um, it's not anywhere near as simple as Doppler radar and looking at weather here on the Earth in the atmosphere. But yes, there's a huge effort to try to study the solar wind and how it affects the Earth and how it connects to the other planets and to try to be able to predict it and um, to measure the particles that are in it. There's a spacecraft called Parker Solar Probe that's doing that. There are spacecraft orbiting the Earth trying to measure those things. I mean, it has practical consequences, right? When we get a solar flare or something, uh, it can wipe out uh, satellites here at the Earth or radio communications for a while or even take out the power grid if it's bad enough. So um, <clears throat> all of that's under study. Yes, there's a, there's a whole branch of science and a whole arm of NASA that's uh, interested in what they call the Sun-Earth connection, the connection between the Sun and the Earth being the solar wind. In terms of the interstellar medium, uh, solar wind kind of dominates the interplanetary medium, so that's the stuff within our own solar system. Yes, in principle, the interstellar medium should be, the, the material between the stars, should be affected greatly by stellar winds. That's probably the source for most of it. Although, remember, there's things like supernova too, which you can think of as a stellar wind, but it's sort of all at once, right? If the star explodes and all that material goes out into space, that's going to be much more dramatic than the solar wind that's coming off the star a bit at a time. Uh, but we don't understand that connection very well at all yet uh, because <clears throat> it's a lot harder to do measurements, you know, remotely when you're looking at the interstellar medium. So there is a connection to the solar wind. I don't think, well, I'm not, there. I'm not aware of anybody who's really got a, a solid <coughs> even description of what they think is happening for how the stellar winds affect the, inter the interstellar medium. Thank you. Although Listen. Tim's kind of an expert on stars, we really probably ought to let him answer that and see if he's got a better answer than I just gave. Um. <coughs> we have some questions on Zoom. Cool. The, the, the bottom, well, the, forget Amboy, they don't need to know Second that. from bottom. Yeah, how are the students selected? How are the students selected? How are the students selected is the question. Right, and is there a cost that the students have to pay? So, so far, how the students have been selected is anybody who is willing to do the training as a teacher, or even, especially during the pandemic, we had a few students who would do the training on their own because they weren't in direct contact with the teacher. We've been able to say yes. In the long run, um, <coughs> If we get to the point where uh, we don't have enough telescope time to satisfy everybody's needs and we're not able to combine them into larger groups and so forth, we'll have to make some kind of judgments and it'll probably be based on number of students and maybe give preference to students in the United States and so forth. But we haven't had that problem. Um, we've been able to, you know, if we have five students here and 10 students there, we've been able to put them together uh, have them join with an existing class or things like that. So, so far we're still taking all comers. Who pays uh, for it? And somebody's asking who, who pays oh, yeah. for it. Um, <clears throat> so, 
for the most part, uh, the Lewis Center gets money from uh, donations and things like that, and the scientist side of it at JPL is paid for by NASA, and a lot of volunteer time, and we like to say that you know, what happens with people who work on Gabbard is when they retire, we get more time from them instead of less. Uh, because we have a history of, of people retiring and then saying, but I'm going to come back and volunteer on Gabbard. Uh, there are some costs at the schools. We try to keep that really low because, um, you know, most schools don't have money to spend on stuff like this. So typically the cost at the, to the school is going to be sending a teacher to wherever we're doing the training if, we're, if they're not doing the training online. Um, if they want to if, if we do things like, for example, when Juno launched and when Juno arrived at Jupiter, we said any Gavard student, we're going to treat you as part of the science team. If you want to come to the launch or come to the event at JPL and watch it when it goes into orbit at Jupiter, just like we would with any scientist who didn't have a job to do on that day, we'd say you're welcome to come, but you got to pay your own way to get there. So uh, we did have students come to both of those events but we weren't able to give them money to do so. They had to find their own. Um, Are there any other questions uh, from the uh, Zoom people? Anyone can speak up if you want, so we should be able to hear you. Yeah, I just had a question on, uh, on the chat. I, been, I just uh, went to the Juno page, and I can't find the section on how to contribute as a citizen scientist. Uh, maybe oh, OK. So uh, the. If you went to the Juno page, you probably saw something on Juno Cam, right? Did it missionjuno.swri.edu? Is that the website where you are? You're muted. He's probably looking at the website now to make yeah, sure he's it's the right at, one. He's probably looking for it. I could tell. So uh, what you want to do is go to the thing that says image processing. Okay. And it should show you what other people have done with Juno camera, Juno Cam data and um, how to get connected yourself. But okay. basically, we put the raw data on the website, and we let anybody who wants to process it into images, play with the color scales and the contrasts, and make montages and movies and so forth, and then upload the result on the website with a little bit of moderation to make sure that what they up upload is uh, somehow vaguely relevant to Juno. Okay, thanks. Sure. There's one here from uh, it says Pablo. Uh, to, every, uh, to everyone, I've been to the Juno page just now, and I can't find the section. Oh, that's what is he that, Is that you and how to contribute? Yeah, that's the same okay, question. Get that one done? Yeah. Okay, any other questions up, uh, from the, over here? Okay, I'll be right I there. Have, I have a question. Okay, well, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, who? You can go ahead. Uh, on Zoom. Okay, so the, the, uh, the corona you mentioned is much hotter than the chromosphere, and yeah. there's a... There's uh, some kind of force, if I'm understanding what you're saying, that's pushing the corona out. Uh, and are you saying scientists don't know what that is, uh, that force? So the, the broad picture, which we think we understand, is the magnetic field on the sun is extremely turbulent, and there's lots of energy coming from the sun to push it around. If you take charged particles, so electrons or protons, basically, uh, and put them in a magnetic field, they're going to be trapped in the magnetic field. They have to spiral around it because of the magnetic force. And so when the magnetic field changes, that pushes those particles around. The bound to be charged particles on the surface of the sun because it's so hot that everything's ionized. So the magnetic field and the fact that it's turbulent and whipping around carries those charged particles way out away from the sun to the, where the corona is. And that's why there's this very energetic, very thin plasma out at the corona is because it's driven by the magnetic field. But the details of how that works and how you know, the particles acquire the amount of energy that they acquire and the density that's there and how it's affected by sunspots as opposed to the rest of the sun and so forth, that stuff is still not as well understood as we'd like, and that's where the radio data is useful to try to help figure all of that out. Does that force come out uniformly? So it's not like a rocket engine pushing the no, sun. No, it's, it's 
<laughs> it's very chaotic. You would not expect it to be uniform at all, and it's not. So think of it, I mean, a, a very simplified geometrical picture that works reasonably well is if you think of the lines of the magnetic field, so, you know, like a, you've probably seen a bar ma magnet and you put iron filings and you can see how it makes those lines that show you the direction of the magnetic field. Think of those lines as a tangled mess that's being whipped around and the electrons and protons are like little beads that are stuck on the line and free to slide up and down the line but can't leave it. So is the sun moving up and down, you know, back and forth? Kind so it's of not the sun itself, it's the magnetic field generated by the sun. But that's very turbulent. The, you know, okay. the sun is, is millions of hydrogen bombs going off all at once all the time. So there's huge amount of energy right. and it's, it's not a smooth, simple, easy process. It's a mess. And if you take a tangled mess of magnetic field, you're going to get particles accelerated and you're going to get all kinds of strange stuff. It's understanding the details of exactly how that works. That's the puzzle. Okay, thanks. We have a question here uh, in the house. Hello, um, thank you for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, if I had a question about radio telescopes, mm -hmm. if I were to build a small one with, say, like a satellite TV dish or something, can mm -hmm. I do any useful radio astronomy with it, or is it too small to resolve anything uh, interesting? So the answer is probably yes. You'll find it, I think, harder than joining up with us, but it might be more fun if you're into that sort of thing. And if you're looking for other people doing that, there's a project called Radio Jove um, that tries to, ha they have like a kit of here's how we build our radio telescope, but they try to help people build that sort of thing. Um, there may well be other projects um, that I'm not familiar with. and. Uh, I'm sure you could come up with something on your own if you spend enough time working on it and, and uh, reading about it. But I would start by looking up Radio Jove and maybe look for other people that, that reference them, and I'll bet you'll find some stuff that's already out there. You have another question in the in house here? Thank you. Jennifer, Thank our you teacher, for the talk. right? I very much enjoyed it. So, as a teacher wanting to get the training, what would that cost me? Uh, nothing. Oh. So, um, what, what you might wind up doing, though, is having to pay your own transportation or hotel room or whatever to go to wherever we're doing the training if you do it in person. Okay. And I would recommend highly um, that eventually you do an in-person training. But you can do it online uh, and get enough to get started. All you have to do is go to our website, and there's a, a thing on the website. In fact, let me bring it up if we can. Uh, I guess we can't see the Zoom if I do that. So you said wherever you're doing the in-person training, and how do we learn where that is happening? That'll also be on the website. Yeah, okay. But the, <laughs> yeah, I'll fix, I'll, I'll fix it in a minute. Let me get a website. And, and you were uh, saying yeah. earlier the Radio Jove? Yeah, so that's a NASA program. Uh, yeah, here, I, I'm doing two things at once, sorry. Um, So let me see if I can get the website up so you can see it. Uh, I have to move it to the other screen here. If I can figure out how, there we go. Okay, so on our website, which now I can't see because it's on <laughs> the wrong screen for me, um, but there's a, yeah, it's a little far for me to, to see it over there. But on the website, if you just Google Gavert or go to gavert.lewiscenter.org, uh, um, one of the items here is join us, mm -hmm. and it tells you how to get on the mailing list and where to do the training online. And, you know, if you want to join the, join the team, it tells you about how to do it. Got it. Thank you. And you can also, I mean, if that's, if that's not working out uh, for you and you want um, somebody to, to talk to and say, hey, I'm trying to make this work and it isn't happening, my email address is steven.levin at jpl.nasa.gov. Question over here. Uh, let me go down there, get them first. Is there any more in Zoom, a question on Zoom at all? Yes, no? OK. 
Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay, uh, go ahead. Then we'll get to in the house next. Okay. Okay. Re regarding the mechanics of how you allocate student resources, like on the study, you have a 200 megahertz spectrum analyzer. Do you give out slices of spectrum to different classes, and if they fail to do a segment, do you reallocate it? There must be a, a, a allocation traffic cop to make it all work efficiently. Yeah. So what we do with SETI is. We make all the data available on the website so anybody in the world can access it. We, uh, when, the, when a teacher says, I want to do SETI with my classroom, we try to set it up so at least before the first time, I have connected with them in person or on Zoom and walked through half an hour of this is what we're trying to do and how it works. And then we leave it up to the teacher, but most of them, what they do is, uh, have the kids start observing a sky frame. So they observe, it's about a 45 minute observation period to do one of the little patches of sky. And while that data is coming in, or sometimes on a different class on a different day, they look at data that's already been collected and they'll typically break it up among the students and say, you know, this group of students take the first 10 megahertz, you take the next 10 megahertz and so forth to cover the whole spectrum and look for RFI and they send us a report and then we put the report we look at it usually first to make sure there's nothing missing like you know the name of the school or whatever um, <clears throat> but then we put it online on the same website and uh, the reports are available for everybody so anybody in the world can look at all those reports and say you know sky frame number 437 was observed three times let me go look at the reports and see if any of the candidates in those reports match up. And we also occasionally have people reanalyze some particular observation that's already been analyzed and if they send us a report for that we'll post it as well because it's good to have comparisons to see if a different group of people got the same set of RFI and the same candidates. There's a whole process we try to make it really easy to identify the interference and remove it. Um, we we stop short of letting you select it graphically because of that fifth grade math standard. You, you really got to know your decimals. Um, the teachers didn't want us to make that uh, too easy to do without learning your decimals. Um, but for the, for the most part, uh, we try to analyze it. You know, we let students analyze it the way I would analyze it if I was going to spend my time analyzing the SETI data. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was, uh, I had a T1 line, if you know what that is, mm -hmm. and then uh, I had about 50 idle computers that I donated time on for SETI. Right. I was wondering if you still did that and what exactly was happening there. So um, it's a completely different SETI project than ours. <laughs> I'm familiar with it. That was what's called SETI at Home. Uh, the lead for that is Dan Wertheimer, who actually, he's at Berkeley, but he, his group actually um, uh, built the spectrometer that we're currently using. And what was going on there was partly the way they were doing it, they were limited by computing power and they were making use of the computer power of the world by letting anybody who wanted to donate computer time. And partly it was kind of a gimmick. Um, it was a way to let people be involved even when the way they were doing their particular SETI search wasn't so easy to explain to people and bring somebody up to speed enough where the human being could contribute something that you needed a human being for. And um, the computing power they got from SETI at home um, was probably more than they could have just bought computers to do. But if you put together the whole effort and so forth, you probably wouldn't do it if it was just for the purpose of uh, getting that extra computing power. The fact that you could get a, let a whole bunch of people be involved and learn about the project and so forth is part of why it was worth doing. I don't know if they're still doing that, um, and I don't know the circumstances now. If they are still doing it, it could be that now you know, they really need that computing power uh, and, it, and it's contributing a lot, or it could be that it's contributing even less than it used to in terms of 
what you could do if you just bought some supercomputers. I, I don't know the answer. We have a couple of more questions here in the house. <laughs> Hello. Um, I understand that the radio telescope uh, measures the uh, radio waves, but um, I like to know how uh, you uh, uh, distinguish the uh, radio waves uh, from the ones that are just uh, red shifted uh, higher energy waves. Sure. So, um, in some sense, the answer to that is you don't. Um, but in reality, um, effectively, you can. So, um, <clears throat> if I, for just to, for, so everybody's on the same page. Uh, if I look at light coming from a galaxy that's really far away, that light is going to be redshifted because the galaxy is moving away from us. So it's going to be lower frequency when it gets to us than what was emitted in the first place at the galaxy. And so uh, if I'm looking at radio waves and they're coming from something that's really far away and as part of the expansion of the universe is moving away from us really fast, the, they could have been emitted at some much higher frequency. However, when you're using a single dish like this um, and looking at a source like, say, Jupiter, Jupiter is so bright compared to all the other stuff that you really don't have to worry about that much. Um, we do occasionally have, because Jupiter moves, have it pass in front of a source in our galaxy that contributes a little bit of extra noise that we have to take into account. But those aren't really redshifted signals either. Those are radio signals from quasars uh, um, <coughs> or uh, some local source or whatever in, in the galaxy. And, <coughs> and we can tell what they are because Jupiter's moving. So you look at the sky before Jupiter gets in front of it, and then you look at Jupiter when it's in front of it, and you look at Jupiter when it's not in front of it, and you can sort it out pretty well. Thank you. Um, oh, and I should say, I started my... Uh, scientific career working on measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is exactly what you were talking about, redshifted radiation, and at about the most extreme as it ever gets. So the cosmic microwave background radiation um, <coughs> is radio waves with an equivalent brightness temperature of a few degrees above absolute zero, and it's the light left over from the Big Bang at the start of the universe. So it started as extremely intense, extremely bright, extremely high frequency radiation. And then it's had 13 billion years to expand and cool off. And the cosmic background that we see now spread throughout the universe is that remnant. So yeah, you can use radio waves to do that. It's just with a, the way we do our observations, that sort of stuff is not really an issue. Okay, we have time for only about a couple more questions because we want to get to the raffle real quick here. So here we go, in-house. Thank you. Um, my question is about Juno. Um, uh -huh. I don't know if uh, Juno was the tel uh, satellite or it was, if it was New Horizons, but I saw a thing that en Enceladus, the moon, like there was like a lot of liquid coming from the southern pole. Did it ever touch Juno? And my second question is, um, Based with Juno, what was your proudest moment like when it came to Juno interacting with uh, Jupiter? Because I saw a story about the uh, like the hexagon or or the pole, uh, the northern poles, and how the um, Jupiter looks compared to what we thought about maybe like the the storms that are all circular right. going around. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk a little bit about the relationship with Juno and Jupiter? Sure. Um, first, I want to say there's a little bit. Uh, um, combined there in what you're describing. Some of what you talked about is at Saturn and some of it is at Jupiter. Some of it's from Cassini and some of it's from Juno. So Enceladus is a, a moon of Saturn and uh, I don't know, uh, but I suspect that Cassini never got uh, close enough to it at the time when it was producing a plume to actually have any interact with the sp interaction with the spacecraft itself or they would have discovered it a lot quicker. Um, but I don't actually know. Uh, not my spacecraft, and, and uh, I got enough to deal with trying to keep track of Jupiter. Um, let's see, the, the other part of it, our proudest moment on Juno, it's really hard. It's like asking which of your kids do you love the best. Um, but I would say, well, I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you um, two different things. 
So the one that's easier to understand uh, uh, and therefore uh, maybe, uh, you know, it maybe should be first in terms of big discoveries is that Jupiter's magnetic field is just bizarre. <laughs> um, here on the Earth, look at the magnetic field and it's basically a dipole, right? Like a big bar magnet. Now we know that the closer you get to the source of a magnetic field, the easier it is to see the higher order components. Or another way of saying that is the, the dipole part of a magnetic field fades away the, the most slowly as you move away from it, and the higher, more complicated things fade away quicker. But nonetheless, Jupiter's magnetic field, we got really close so we could measure it, and it's crazy. <laughs> it's, um, instead of a dipole, um, in the southern hemisphere, it mostly looks like a dipole. In the north, it's completely different with like a dozen different spots where the magnetic field's coming out of the planet. And down near the equator, there's this thing we're calling the great blue spot where the magnetic field lines just go right into the planet. It's really weird. If you, you probably don't have time for me to go find the movie that, that shows, shows it, but that was a really weird, amazing discovery. And we got the first hint of that on the very first day. Um, the other thing that I think of as the really big discovery um, of Juno, and there's a million of them, but the, the one that is really impressive and important to me um, is a little esoteric. But everybody, and I mean everybody, who had models of what Jupiter, how Jupiter behaves and talks about the atmosphere of Jupiter and so forth, thought <coughs> before we got there with Juno that if you went down into the atmosphere below the clouds, below where the water clouds are, that you're below where the sunlight can reach, you're below all the weather because the clouds are up above you, and it's a giant ball of gas, it should be well mixed. They had a whole spacecraft that went to Jupiter with a probe, Galileo in the 90s, dropped a probe into Jupiter and the idea was we're going to get deep enough to where it's well mixed, we'll be measuring the, the real composition of the planet and not be subject to the vagaries of, of the weather and so forth. It got down to about 20 bar, 20 times the pressure here on the Earth. I think 22 is where it got to. And that turned out not to be deep enough. And everybody thought <coughs> we got unlucky. It went into a special hot spot, and it did. And, and if you had gone just a little deeper, we would have got to where it's well mixed. We got there with Juno with a microwave radiometer capable of easily measuring down to 100 bars. And we found it's not well mixed. It's you're, you're, you're hundreds of kilometers below where the clouds are. You're so deep, there's no sunlight getting down there. It's made out of gas, and yet it has all this structure. The equator doesn't look like the other latitudes. Um, you look at where the ammonia is, and there's, you start at the top and there's ammonia, and then you start having it go away, and then it comes back again, down at 100 bars. Um, the, there's a region more or less at the equator that's got a bunch of, of, like a vertical region that looks pretty well mixed and the ammonia is concentrated there. But just north of that, you're missing a bunch of ammonia. And it's not really at the equator, it's actually two or three degrees north of the equator. Jupiter's atmosphere on a global scale is just looking really weird. <laughs> so it's a hard discovery to explain to people because you got to go through a lot of why everybody thought it should look like this and so forth. Um, but to me, that's one of the most puzzling and therefore most exciting discoveries of Juno. It's just that giant planet atmospheres are way more complicated than anybody thought they were going to be. Yeah. There's a ton more, but um, I... Yeah, so, so we're looking for the oxygen content in Jupiter's atmosphere. He was asking about a, a layer of oxygen. Um, and we found that that's more complicated than expected as well. We think we finally have that pretty close to nailed down and um, watch for the paper on that to come out uh, within the next year that'll tell you here's what we think the oxygen content on Jupiter is. So I won't spoil it by announcing it before we're peer-reviewed. Um, I... We'll play it. <coughs> right. If you... Um, I, I've given talks on 
on Juno and science results, and so has Scott Bolton, the principal investigator for Juno. So if you just go on YouTube and search for Juno and Steve Levin or Juno and Scott Bolton, you'll probably find one of those. You can get an hour or two to answer that question instead of a minute or two. Sure. It's about time Thank to you very much. My pleasure. It's been fun. All right. Um, did everyone get a raffle ticket in-house? If anyone did not get one, you know here. And uh, Spencer, do we have the people online? Have they gone to the? Only six people? So all of the Zoom people, there's only six of you. That'll be good, I think. There's more than six. Any other Zoom people that have not gone to the website to sign up for the raffle? We do have a few things to give away. Um, we, can, we can drop that back in there. In the meantime, in the meantime, we'll do the in-house one. Uh, I don't know who's got the tickets. We're getting the last few people that didn't get a ticket in-house. And then Greg will bring the box down and we'll pick a couple out. We have three winners. They keep the keep part. And you too, Dave. And Dave Yackerson. Keep it, keeping it going. You got them all? All right. Well, I have a green laser pointer. So the first green laser pointer goes to. Am I picking? You telling. You saying who it is, though. Seven thirty two. Seven thirty two. Seven thirty two? Right there? You just got your ticket. <laughs> All right. Come on down. Come on down, get your pair. We'll pick another one. Boy, I have another laser printer. Oh, amazing. We'll pick another ticket. It's almost like we bought a whole box of Here's the uh, second one. Last three numbers are seven one zero. Seven one zero, and the final laser pointer will go to seven three five. Seven thirty five. All right, here we go. Come and get your lasers. Okay, uh, so we're done in here. So a couple of things. Uh, Wednesday nights at Garvey, if you have a telescope, you don't know how to use it, you want to learn something, you want to learn from other members, almost always people are there at Garvey Ranch Park in Monterey Park. You can go to the website, I'll give you directions to get there. Uh, good place. A lot of people hanging out. A lot of the regular members are there. And uh, also the telescope loaner program is happening there. So if you need to borrow a telescope, we have a few. Uh, second is the 26th is the next Griffith Star Party here? Until 11? So we got the extended time now. Fantastic, okay. All right, so we wouldn't have to pack up and leave at 10. Yay! All right, that's really good. Um, and then next Saturday is Dark Sky Night. And then every Wednesday at Garvey. 
from, are we officially open at 7 to 10 now? Okay. All right, so from 7 to 10 are our official open hours at, at Garvey. Sometimes we hang a little later, almost never earlier though. Oh, okay, you're going to be getting there to set up for the scouts? Okay. All right, so this particular Wednesday, 6.30 or so? Okay. All right, by 6. Okay, good. So we'll have plenty. So anyone who wants to come there, please do for the telescopes for the scouts. Are we uh, good to go on the... No, I, no are we going to see that on the screen? I'm not sure if we have the people that were online. Yeah, sure. Will that come up on the screen here? Yeah. All right, good. Now, the people online, I talked to Alicia earlier today, and she was unsure what we'd be able to send. But usually, uh, the things that we do for the Zoom meeting people are uh, a website uh, gift from the website, uh, the merchandise from the website, and uh, Amazon gift cards. And what was the other thing? Sometimes, sometimes she also sends people lasers as well. Okay. So I'm not sure what each person is going to get, but she will email you. With I'll let you know. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, well then take over. <laughs> awesome. Okay. 100 inch nights That's are full. It. There's one night and it's completely full. Uh, the only nights that we have that are open, I think, are uh, can't think of it. I'll look at. I'll look it up. I can look at that. See if I can see it right here. Okay. So it looks like the first winter is uh, Kimberly Holmes. Is that correct? Who? Oh, yeah. That's correct. Kimberly Holmes, awesome. first one. Okay, so Kimberly, you won uh, 15 by 70 Celestron binoculars. Oh, excellent. That's wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. Man, this worked out pretty good. Yeah, it's a good one. Okay. So the next winner is Kevin Gilchrist. And Kevin. What did I win? Oh, I'm about to tell you. Hold on. Make sure I got say this right. If I can, there we go. All right. You won uh, Constellation drinking glasses. Ooh, cool. They're really cool. Sounds great. Thank you. I think you accidentally indeed, uh, erased the entire Tom Hendricks row. What happened there? Kimberly? Kimberly is still there. Oh. What did she erase? You need to delete Kimberly. Kimberly she has her one. She has one. And she accidentally deleted somebody else? Yeah. Tom Hendricks. This is, this oh, Tom. She can, she can go backwards. I don't see Tom yet. Spencer. Yeah. So who got knocked off? Uh, Tom. 
Tom Pendrick got deleted by accident, Spencer. And Kimberly Holmes should be. But only on this page, not herself. Thank you. Can't back it up. Okay. The last one was Robert Ramirez. Robert Ramirez. So we're trying something new here. Oh, wait. It says Mike Gardner. Am I reading that right? Is it Robert? Robert Ramirez, Ramirez is the correct winner right now. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So Robert Ramirez won $25 off a 60 inch half night. Sounds great. Thank you so much. $25 off of a 60 inch half night. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have a banquet. We do are going to have the banquet in person again this year in January. Do we have a date? Okay, we got stuff sending out. Um, I do have a few openings uh, for the 60 inch on Saturday the 16th. So if you want to go to that, contact me at uh, Mount Wilson coordinator, all one word, at laas.org. That's September, right? September 16th, Saturday, half night. Yeah, uh, always give the month because, you know. Thought I did. Okay, um, that's really all I have, I think. And we have uh, a few minutes to just chatter around. So we could probably stop the recording and just have a little bit of chat in person here. We got about uh, 